look, uh, first of all, uh, for those who don't know Octopus Energy, um, uh, we started six years ago, so I don't blame you. Uh, but today, we've got around 3 million household customers in the UK, and we actually have uh, household customers in four or five other countries as well. Uh, we're based on a technology platform that we built for the future of energy. It's called Crack, and I'll talk about that a bit in a minute. Um, but we license that around the world, including to Origin Energy in Australia. And our connections with Australia run deep. Uh, I should say that I think Australia's got the most exciting energy future imaginable. And uh, it was one of the reasons that it was the first country that we started operating outside the UK. We're now in a dozen countries. Um, and our platform's licensed to about 22 million customers globally. So growing rapidly, using technology to drive down the cost of energy as we go green. Uh, let's um, first of all think a little bit about what technology really means. Because I think many incumbent industries try and use technology to replace what they currently do like for like. I, I just got a 3D printer and it can be used to make sculptures. But it doesn't have little hands that chisel. It's not a like for like replacement for a sculpture. It layers down substrate bit by bit to print something. When you invent new technology, you change the way you think about processes in every way. Uh, when Steve Jobs launched the iPhone uh, in, I think, 2007 or 2006, no one foresaw that it would mean the end of the cab industry as we know it. Uh, no one foresaw that there'd be a global pandemic where phones were ubiquitous with QR codes that you could use to enter venues and even to enter countries. The technology transformed society in a way that nobody saw. In fact, my 97-year-old uh, gran, like when, when the um, geeks were queuing outside the Apple store to buy this 425-pound bit of kit with a 35-pound a month rental, uh, you know, I ridiculed them. I didn't see that you know, within a decade, it would have led the way to the $40 Android that's democratized communications globally and meant that, yeah, my 97-year-old grand during the pandemic could stay in touch with her family from sheltered accommodation. We don't see these colossal changes that technology brings. Instead, most of the resistance we have to technology is based around imagining some sort of, you know, the question with the iPhone would have been, well, what use is that to my gran? Well, I think we found out what use it was. Green energy has got so much in common with that revolution. Um, and I think um, to understand the opportunity for technology, uh, we need to step back a bit and think about um, customers, about society. Um, because if we try to use green energy as a like-for-like -like replacement for fossil fuels, the transition will be unbelievably expensive and slow. It will be too slow to stop climate change, it'll be too expensive for citizens to support it. What we need to do instead is recognize it's just different. Energy companies around the world, grids, governments, and regulators, they love rectangles. They think in rectangles, right? You turn a power station on, you get a rectangle, you turn it off. You want to have a curve, great, we'll do a rectangle, stick a rectangle, stick a rectangle, there you go, that's our power system, all right? But renewable energy doesn't fit rectangles. It's kind of, I mean, I know in Australia, the sun shines all the time, sort of, except for climate change. But the, um, look, uh, look around the world. Uh, we talk about renewables being a problem because they're intermittent. You know, we get spikes in energy, and then we get periods of none. If we had never had fossil fuels, if we'd never experienced the world of rectangles, we'd still have built a modern society. We'd have still had advanced sort of economies. It's just that, um, well, they'd have been uh, cleaner quieter, the city would smell like the countryside, oh, and we wouldn't have climate change. So we know that human ingenuity would have harnessed alternative energy sources if we hadn't got to fossil fuels first. So instead of thinking incrementally about how do we try and replace our rectangles with fossil fuels, uh, sorry, with renewables, we think about what that society would have been. It makes it a lot easier to see how technology and innovation will drive us to a cleaner world faster and cheaper than we imagine. What we'd have done is we'd have loved those periods of really high renewable generation. We'd have scooped up, we'd have harvested those green electrons, and we'd have done everything we could with those zero marginal cost, zero carbon, guilt-free electrons. And then at times when there's less available, well, first of all, we'd need less because we'd use it when it was abundant. 
right? We've already escaped from the world of rectangles. This is exciting. Um, but it would also mean that we could afford to spend more to fill the gaps because it was so cheap at the times of plenty. And that's the kind of world we need to move towards. And so when I talked about Kraken, our platform earlier, uh, look, today Kraken supports millions of customers across the globe dealing with actually what is the single biggest problem in energy, uh, shit service. Um, it delivers outstanding service, which is why Octopus is recommended by which the UK Consumer Association, four years in a row, top of trust pilot, you know, seven out of 10 awards on U-Switch. It does very well on the thing that if you ask customers what really matters, service and value, it wins. But far more importantly, technology like Kraken is designed for that future. Um, and I say that future, by the way, one thing uh, Bill Gates said is, we are living in the future, right? You know, you've all got the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in your pocket. I mean, you know, an iPhone with access to Wikipedia, that is literally the stuff of science fiction from a couple of decades ago. We're living in that future now where an electric car is genuinely cheaper to own and run than an internal combustion car, right? I mean, you won't see that in the media, but it's the facts. And where if you go on Alibaba, you can buy an electric car for twelve to $15,000 with a 250-mile range. This is an incredible complement to renewable energy. A typical electric car holds about five days worth of electricity for a UK household. So we really can harvest those green electrons when they're abundant and fill our batteries. As soon as we're doing that, we're able to make the most of the green electrons when they're abundant, and that enables us to afford to fill the gaps more easily. Um, so I think when we talk about how technology works, it's like today's grid and today's energy companies are run like mini cab offices, like taxi offices. You know, you've literally got blokes with phones and levers that want to turn on a rectangle, you know, dispatch the power the way we dispatch cars. But it needs to move into the world of Uber, where in real time, we're forecasting and shifting demand and consumption to make the most of green electrons. I'll give you a, a, a kind of a quick taste of that. Today, Octopus forecasts every customer in the UK at the half hourly level for two years. It uses machine learning, and every night, those forecasts are adjusted. It meant that when the pandemic hit, within a day, we were already handling the change in demand as people started working from home. And we were able to do it on a localized level when you had lockdown in one city, but not another. That drives down the cost of energy, even in today's system. But if you want to make the most of renewables, you know, we've got a world today where in the UK last year, in the first quarter, we threw away 300 million pounds worth of green electrons because we had no demand for them, right? They were being generated in the wrong, because asset managers stick up turbines where they get the grants and that doesn't really take any account of consumption. What we need to move towards is a world where, for example, every single turbine is giving us uh, you know, a two-week rolling forecast. Every solar panel is giving us a rolling forecast based on the you know, kind of weather forecast in its locale. And then on a two-week basis, what we're doing, today's Monday, I mean, today's, what day is it? Today? Thursday, right? So today's Thursday. We'd say, look, we've got low wind forecast for the next five days. So what we'll do is we'll not fill electric car batteries for the next five days unless people need it, because the machine learning tells us when they're going to need their cars. They can always override it if they want to. There's no point wasting those electrons when we haven't got many. And then we'll fill our boots in five days' time when it's windy. That's the world we need to move towards. Now, in moving towards that world, and you know, kind of isn't that hard. All the technology is there today. And, and I think one of the myths of renewable energy has often been this idea that the more of it, you know, it's the first 20% e is easy and then it gets harder and harder. It's the other way around. Because the more we can use green electrons when they're abundant and near zero marginal cost, driven by technology, the cheaper all of our core usage gets, the more we can afford to fill the gaps as we go forward. And it was fascinating listening to Andrew talking about, for example, hydrogen and ammonia. Put that in the mix. So now when you've got your wind turbine, your wind farm, and you can make high green hydrogen co-located with your wind, and you're able to forecast the demand and shift the demand for electric cars and electric heating and for industry and for agriculture, then at any moment in time, you're decisioning, are we using this wind to create electricity we put into the grid? Are we using it to create electricity to go into batteries of cars? Are we using it to make hydrogen? If we're making hydrogen, are we going to turn it back into electricity in a couple of days' time? Or are we going to be shipping it, for example, from Australia to Japan? Are we going to be using spare electricity to power on a nation with virtually free electricity most of the time? Now, the machine learning that sits there to do all this is available basically today. What we don't have is the economic structures. We still have a, a world in which 
central planners are deciding how much of each kind of generation we're going to have where. And what we really need is the free market, the economic price signals that reveal the opportunity for an innovative company to say, look, our combination of wind and solar and hydrogen and ammonia can deliver what customers need in this bit of the grid. Our ability to shift customers' demand and to understand their driving habits and their heating habits and to work with industry will enable us to produce cheaper electricity for everyone and great product for export. It, it may sound a little bit kind of pie in the sky, but when Steve Jobs launched the iPhone, Nokia knew it wouldn't work. They knew it wouldn't because they'd done the consumer research. No one wanted a phone with a touchscreen. Steve Ballmer was interviewed on US TV news about it, and he literally burst out laughing. He said, no one's going to be able to send emails if you haven't got touch buttons. All right? Steve Ballmer was the CEO of Microsoft at the time, a company that doesn't really exist in mobile phones. Um, so I think a lot of the time with technology, you have to imagine that world and then build towards it. Um, but you see glimpses of it even now. Uh, we were looking at our industrial customers, and we found we've got a bunch of customers doing vertical farming. Now, I thought this was a gimmick, just like I thought the iPhone was a gimmick, right? But, but they were using quite a lot of electricity, so we went to see one. And what we found they were doing was uh, we've got dynamic pricing. We use um, real-time pricing for some customers based upon what's go particularly what's going on in renewables. And the vertical farms had optimized their plants. Right, so these are indoor farms growing soft fruit and veg in cities and towns here in the UK. So instead of the food miles of shipping it over from hot countries, you're growing it where it's going to get used. Um, and what they found was that these farms, 99% of the water that goes in, by the way, into the farm leaves in the fruit and veg. It's all closed environment. There's no pesticides, closed environment. The biggest cost is energy. But by harnessing green energy, what they were doing was when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, green electricity is in scarce supply, in fact, it's expensive, the plants sleep. So their plants now have a diurnal cycle based around the real-time price of electricity. All right? Now that lets you have virtually carbon-free, fresh fruit and veg with no insects, no pesticides, grown right where we're going to consume it. That's the kind of total dislocation, disruption, that no one would have forecast. That a world based around capitalizing on the characteristics renewables lets us have. And you go further, right? So Octopus is doing incredible amounts of work in research and development for decarbonized heating to use electric heat pumps. By the way, for those who don't know an electric heat pump, it turns one kilowatt hour of electricity into three kilowatt hours of heat. The best you can do with methane is one kilowatt hour of gas into 0.9-ish kilowatt hours of heat. So electric heat pumps are three and a half times more energy efficient. All right? So when you're building electric systems, suddenly you start to have access to technology like that. Um, but people say, well, what, what do you do when it's not windy enough to generate the UK's kind of heating needs? Well, first of all, let's build loads of wind. Right? And they go, well, you're going to be wasting wind. You know, if you've got enough to meet your winter heating needs, then you've got far too much for the rest of the year. And I listen to that as an economist, as a technologist. And I go, well, amazing. That means that like, for nine months of the year, the UK can have basically near enough free electricity. Now, of course, that's fantastic for citizens. If you want to take citizens on a renewable journey, tell them that. But then, think about what that means for industry. All those industries that are getting carbon tax now, that have moved to uh, countries like China, that are creating the carbon emissions that we worry about, they can start to come back. And they can operate for nine months a year, 24-7, unbelievably cheaply. So now, now, all we need to do to unlock that, by the way, is build more wind. Because then the price will fall, and that's what will happen. So I guess. For me, really what I wanted to talk about was the way in which technology enables us to think about the system totally differently. And I don't think, I don't think it's any longer pie in the sky to talk about a green industrial revolution. The last industrial revolution was, it came about because we suddenly discovered how to unlock millions of years worth of sunshine from fossil fuels and use it to, harness, to, to power our society. What I've just talked about is the way in which, going forward, we can do the same all over again, but this time without trashing the planet, and probably more cheaply than we ever imagined. So, thank you very much. <laughs>